Pinkerton's Ghosts is a horror anthology podcast by Supermersive Radio, with no affiliation with any detective agency, person real or imagined, or the dark forces of Outreterre. It is not intended for children. Archivist Notes, upload from wire recorded, dating March 17, 1938. I, I turn this thing here? Yes? Uh, okay, here goes. Mm. Joe Redhorse, Pinkerton number 56290. I'm recording this in Chief O'Brien's office before I pass out from blood loss. I wanted to get this down right after things happen while it's clear. I got the call from the boss that this was a rush job and hurried back from Montreal, where I'd wrapped up the occult blood case. I took a train into Pennsylvania Station, walked across town to the Gray Bar building beside Grand Central Terminal. The first body was found before Christmas time last year, Mr. Redhorse, the transit police chief said to me as I sat in his office. We thought it was an isolated case, one of the Hoovervale fellows who was robbed or gotten into a drunken argument. You know how they are. We assumed they'd wandered into the tunnels, and we have miles of them down there, you know. I did know. I make a point of investigating the lay of the land before I go manhunting. Grand Central Terminal covered 48 acres, more than any other railroad station in the world. A literal maze and a perfect place for murder. It was a savage thing. His head was a mess. O'Malley here found him. The uniformed officer standing by the desk was a red-haired, beefy fellow with a florid face. He nodded. It was an ugly thing for sure. Found him down on the new platform I'd been supervising during construction. we just opened number 68. Fresh cement, barely dry it was. And his scalp all but torn off completely. I still get chills. How many since then, I asked. I tried to ignore the stares from O'Malley, whose expression made it clear he did not like an outsider being brought into the investigation, especially one who looked like me with my traditional long hair held in a braid, partly hidden by my worn Stetson fedora. There have been four more bodies found since then, the round-faced chief said. He was middle-aged, overweight, and clearly more bureaucrat than cop. One by the movie theater after it closed, two in the Grand Concourse, and the last one on that platform again. I could see the uniform was getting fidgety with all the talk. He was an all-action type. We've been trying to keep it out of the papers. With them being spaced so far apart and all happening overnight, after midnight, it was easier. All with the same kind of violence? Exactly, O'Malley said, his watery blue eyes narrowing. No one saw a thing. Except one of our boys said he saw a bald fellow across the concourse after the third victim was killed. Says he chased the fellow till he went around to call him and disappeared. He made a dismissive sound. Poof! Like a blowman phantom. Docked him for drinking on duty, I can tell you. You increased your patrols? But even when we flooded the terminal with our boys, we couldn't stop it. His voice was full of repressed anger. It was Mike Finn what was killed then, and a better brother officer you could never find. That one we couldn't keep out of the papers, the chief continued. But after that last time, we, we, we have to catch the series killer fast, or, or public trust will be broken. Public be damned. I want that tug that killed my friend. That will be enough, O'Malley, the chief said sharply. We all feel bad. Do you now? Yes, sergeant the chief snapped. We do. You're only here because of how close you were with Finn, but don't push it. He turned his attention to me. Now, Mr. Horse, Red Horse. Yes, well, your boss, the Pinkerton, seemed to think you were able to help us and told that to the mayor, so here you are. Why is that? There it was. I was not only the out-of-towner, not a regular cop, but I was not even white. I'd seen it in the eyes of so many over the years. I saw it in France and here in the States often as I crisscrossed the country for the Pinkerton's agency, even before they discovered and then made use of my special talents. What were the dates of the murders? I was making notes, a habit my mentor at the Pinkerton's had taught me. It was another fact that seemed to annoy O'Malley. But I had the feeling anything I did would annoy him. He was a billy club cop. Not much for taking notes. The chief looked confused but consulted a folder in front of him. 
December 17th was when the first was killed, though he was found the next day. Uh, next was on January 15th. Next on January 31st. He looks sick just reading the dates. The last was found on February 14th. All full moons, I said flatly. The two men looked at me for a moment as the implications of my words sank in. And tonight, March 16th, is the full moon, I added. That's why the urgent call from my boss. And why is that, Geronimo? O'Malley said, with the insult that naming of that shaman seemed to be for most white people. Not the way I thought of him, though. I've taken down a number of serial killers, I said. First was in the trenches in France, where I was an investigator for military intelligence. A French private had the habit of executing officers and making it look like the Huns did it, did it for the proletariat, but he was just a little too lucky surviving his superiors getting killed. I caught him trying to rig a booby trap for his commander in the headquarters to make it look like enemy action. This isn't France. This is New York. Maybe. But I've run down series killers in Kansas, Boston, and El Paso, Officer O'Malley. Sergeant. Yes. I rose and slipped my notebook into my suit jacket pocket. I'd like to see the site where the first body was found. My manner made it clear the meeting was done. And I hope sent the message that I was the one who determined that. I knew the chief was getting pressure from below his rank and file and above from the mayor's office who wanted confidence in the travel hub safety. The murder of a cop was bad enough, but if word leaked out that there were others killed, it could start a panic. The chief was just glad to get rid of me. The sergeant here will accompany you. He has all the particulars of the victims. O'Malley looked less than delighted. With a last look back at his boss, he led me out of the room and down the flight of stairs to Grand Central Terminal itself. We exited the staircase just inside the Third Avenue entrance of the massive station, walking down a ramp to the station. The terminal had stores and even a movie theater all below ground, with the entrances on 42nd Street as well, virtually a miniature city unto itself. We walked past the newsstand where a radio was playing a news report from Edward R. Morrow about how that German fellow Hitler rode into Vienna triumphantly with the annexing of Austria. I found myself not too interested in one group of people saying they unilaterally took over someone else's country. My people had lived it. I prefer that new radio show, Challenge of the Yukon. At least there was a nice dog in that show. The arch over our heads and the walls were marble as we walked down the gently sloping floor to the cathedral-like main room of the terminal, our shoes echoing on the stone floor. The main concourse was a full 88,000 square feet with giant windows that, in daylight, painted the floor of the space with light, but now, at night, just suggested the life of the city outside. The ceiling above us was 12 stories high and was painted with 2,500 stars in zodiac constellations, illuminated by electric lights in them to give the illusion of an open sky. That ceiling was showing its age, with leaks from the roof making it a muddy mess at this point. O'Malley may have been an old-school billy club cop, but he did his homework and had the facts when I asked for them as we walked. We've looked into the background of every one of the victims. The first was an Italian day laborer who was living in the Hooverville in the park. The second Jewish waitress coming home from a late shift. We went to stand in the center of the huge space by the information booth, where there were four-sided clock, where all the commuters headed for points north, south, east, and west checked their times. It was, I have to say, an awesome place and reminded me of a cathedral in Paris that I'd visited. Even at that time of night, swarms of people were going to and fro, ignoring the odd pair we presented, except to throw an occasional nervous look to the uniformed officer. No connection between them, I take it? None we can find. Nor with the others either. One was a German board member coming through after a Nazi rally at the garden, and another Negro family man returning late night from a musical job upstate. And, of course, Mike Finn. You couldn't get a wider cross-section of the country if you tried. Well, you could if you included the tribes who used to live here. Slipped out before I could stop him. He shot me an angry look, but said nothing. The track where we found the first one and the last is this way, he said, instead of what I imagined he wanted to say. He led me across the vast space to under a mezzanine where there were a number of platforms all below ground. 
They served tracks on the upper and lower levels. It got cold as we walked deeper into the marble and concrete man-made cave with a damp chill that might have been more than physical. In total, there are 68 tracks, including a rail yard and sidings, he said as we went down the steps to a platform at the farthest end of a long tunnel-like corridor. Forty-three tracks are used for passenger service, while the rest are used to store trains. This is the newest platform where the first man and Mike were found. We stood on a typical concrete platform thrust out into the darkness of a tunnel with tracks on either side. There was no train at that moment, but the sounds of the other trains in further bays were like great sleeping beasts, huffing and puffing. They were the iron horses that had trod across my Ogallala ancestral lands, bringing the darkness of the white world with them. There was no sign on the platform where the body had been, but O'Malley was explicit in where and how it had been found. Like most of his scalp had been peeled away with a, a single crude blade. The lab boys said it wasn't a very sharp weapon. I knelt and put a hand on the spot and opened myself to the energy that was there. In a moment, I knew my boss had been right in sending me. This was not just a serious killer in the traditional sense of some madman. What you doing? O'Malley asked. I tried to tune him out and let the spirit of the place fill me, calling on my ancestors to help me find justice for the dead. The violence that had been done there was clear, even with the lingering energies of thousands who had walked in that space, going to and fro, trains and home. There was a strange feeling there as well, oddly familiar. Did you hear me, Geronimo? O'Malley said. What the hell are you doing? I stood and looked the younger man in the face directly. Working, Sergeant. Detecting. Doing what my boss told your boss I would do. So take me to where the other murders happened. He tried to stare me down, but better than he had tried, so in a moment his blue eyes blinked, and he turned without a word and headed back into the main concourse of the station. We stopped just under the mezzanine where he pointed. Labor died here, the Nazi over there. He pointed to the staircase that led up above us. I repeated kneeling at this place. While I could feel the death that had been there, it was a more active area, and with the number of souls who passed through that space, the pain of the dead spirit was faint and distant. O'Malley watched me with slitted eyes and a tinge of disgust. I guess it was not easy for him to see someone like me raised above him, or purportedly doing what he said was his job. But not to worry. I had a job to do. And the other one near the movie theater? I asked. He led me across the main concourse to a side area where there was a movie theater playing a western double bill of Public Cowboy Number 1 with Gene Autry, Call the Three Mesquiteers, and a chapter of the Lone Ranger serial. There was a big cutout of the Ranger out front. Anna Goldberg, waitress, was found here in front of the theater by one of our patrols about two in the morning, O'Malley said. Her hair had been separated from her skull, but coroner said she died of a heart attack. Even though the area had swarmed with people during the days since she had died, I could feel her fear. Fright, I said. She saw her attacker. Oh, yeah, Tonto, he snickered. Uh, you, you got a crystal ball? Not my heritage. But you don't need one to imagine if she saw someone approaching her with a fearsome weapon, she might be shocked, and that might even paralyze her or stop her heart. He didn't like my simple deduction, but had no chance for a snide remark when another uniformed policeman stepped up to say hello. What are you doing out here, Sarge? The new arrival asked. He was clearly another Irishman with a handsome face and jet black hair as dark as my own and gray eyes. He was a decade younger than O'Malley, handsome as a movie star and not yet blasé about policing. I thought your shift was over a while ago. None of that, Barnes, O'Malley said. Get about your rounds and keep a sharp eye. The young officer eyed me with a questioning expression, then looked to O'Malley as if to say, Need help with this one? 
Out loud, Barnes responded easily, Right, Sarge, nothing to worry about, and he headed off. When he was gone, O'Malley's face went sour, and he said again as a slur, What now, chief? We wait, the moon will rise, and if our killer is true to pattern, he will strike some time after it's up. We've looked here all over the place each night of the full moon. We're not dummies, you think we are. We tumbled on to the significance of the dates, and every death was in a straight line from that platform where the first murder happened and the last murder happened, I said. I think that it all goes back to that platform. It was strongest there. It. Oh, boy, I had to explain myself. Call it a hunch, Sergeant. I've come to rely on my hunches. The percentage of my wins works for me on that. He looked skeptical, but even more annoyed when I pulled out a cigar, bit off the end, and lit it up. My mother ice called that a filthy habit, he said as we walked across the concourse, then added, no offense. She felt the same way about a good beer, and I'm afraid I could not agree with her on that. I smiled at his attempt at peacemaking. Ahead of us, the moon was visible through the huge windows over the mezzanine. My people called the first moon in March, the last of winter, the worm moon, for the worm's trails that would appear in the newly thawed ground but I was also aware that it was called the Death Moon by some. I was not sure I liked that omen. I suppose it can be, I said, commenting on his smoking remark as we walked back toward Platform 68, but with my people, tobacco is still a religious thing. Tobacco? Think of it this way. I assume you're Christian? Episcopal? Yes, he said with suspicion. Well, you're all about the incense at Mass, right? He laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! Even more than the Catholics, Mada used to say, twice the incense and half the guilt. Same for us. Pure tobacco is how we speak to the spirits. I just thought I'd light up to make a little prayer. We catch this guy tonight. I'm with you on that one, he said, perhaps a little less attitude in his tone. We passed under the mezzanine, and I felt that death was there again, and had a sudden chill as we approached the corridor to Platform 68 for some reason. I increased my speed. As we rounded the corner to the edge of the platform, I saw a nightmare made real. Officer Barnes was further down the platform, his back to us, walking his beat with nightstick in hand. But between us and him, a beam of light from a window high up touched the platform with the intensity of a surge light. Where it touched the concrete of the platform, a wavy shape was forming, like a golden wisp of smoke. The smoke resolved itself into a frightening but translucent figure of a bearskin-wearing man with only a small crest of hair about two inches on his shaved head and holding a crude stone tomahawk in his hand. He was facing away from us and raised the tomahawk as he moved toward the unsuspecting policeman. It was like watching a nightmare take shape with the liquid reality in the moonlight. Barnes! O'Malley called, just as the phantom raised the weapon. The cop got his billy up in time to block the now solid hatchet that slammed down, shattering the club, and continued to strike the officer, felling him. I was ahead of the sergeant and made it to the fallen officer before the phantom could raise the tomahawk again. I imagine my shock when I did get there and saw the face of the murderous horror. It was a native face. Around his neck, he was wearing ornaments made of stone, shell, animal teeth, and claws. I recognized the designs as the jewelry of the Lenape, the tribe that once lived on Manhattan Island. I physically blocked the phantom's access to the fallen cop and saw the confused expression on his face. He raised the tomahawk to strike at me, and O'Malley drew his gun and fired. The shot was good, and would have hit the apparition through the heart, except that it was an insubstantial thing, a spirit, a dead warrior from who knew how long ago. Instead, the bullet passed through him and slammed into my left side that spun me around, bringing me to my knees. For God's sake, don't shoot me more, I yelled at the cop. The spirit war ignored the gunshot, but seemed to recognize me as one of the people and was apparently shocked. Stay down! I can't get a clear shot! No, wait, I yelled back as I fought to my feet. I need to try and stop him my way. The figure was wavering in and out of focus, like a movie frame or a wisp of smoke. The warrior looked oddly at me, and I realized he could not possibly understand either the white tongue or Ogala. Then I remembered that when my grandmother went deaf, we used to communicate 
with the old sign language the tribes had used as a trade language on the plains for generations. I tried. I am of the they scatter their own people, I signed, using the meaning of my tribe, Oglala's name. What are you called and why are you here? The warrior recognized what I signed and signed back. I am Wolftail of the true people, using the name the Lene Lenape used. This is my land. I hunt the intruders on it. The Eleven demand it. The Lenape were deeply religious people with their beliefs in a creator and the Eleven lesser gods. Why do they demand it? It was the intruders who disturbed my rest. He looked at me and then down at the fallen officer who lie bleeding from a head wound. Why do you defend them? There are too many to chase, brother, I signed. We must live with them now. What's going on? O'Malley called with confusion in his tone. I'm trying to get him to leave. What? He obviously didn't have the belief system to deal with spirits. I did. My people were not as obsessed with the fear of death like the European culture. Just hold off shooting! To Wolf's Tale, I signed, You must leave, brother. Your time is past. Join your people. I was brought here when they defiled my resting place. Oh, Mally, I called. Did they find anything when they excavated this platform? Or just some animal bones is all. They threw them in the concrete mix. White people. It was his grave, Totem, I called. I could see through the ghostly warrior that my statement was getting through to him. The tomahawk in his hand began to become less substantial and transparent. Mit Aka Uyus In, I signed, which means all are related, the equivalent to bless you in my language. I puffed hard on the cigar to send my prayer to the Creator. Wolf's tail expression changed from angry to something like content. Then his whole being wavered and dissolved, a genie being put back in the bottle, the essence of him literally flowing into the platform, and then was gone. O'Malley blew his whistle and raced to my side, just in time to catch me and lower me to the ground. Crazy Indian, he said, as he tore at my vest and used a handkerchief to try and stop the hole he'd made in my side. I didn't mean to shoot you. I know. See to Barnes. He's coming around now. We gotta get you both some help. And he did. And got me back to the chief's office. Barn went straight to the hospital. <clears throat> My suggestions were to close the platform, though I'm not sure they would do that. Barring that, I urged them to have a local shaman perform a full ceremony to try and put the warrior's spirit to rest for good and seal that window that allowed moonlight on that platform. Even O'Malley listened to me seriously. But then maybe he was just a little sorry for shooting me. Hard to tell. At least I was pretty sure he'd look at Lone Ranger Westerns in a different light in regards Tonto. And that is something. One step at a time. <coughs> <coughs> uh, I gotta let him take me to the hospital now. I sure could use some sleep. I'll do a follow-up later, boss. Joe Redhorse signing off. Pinkerton's Ghosts is a podcast distributed by Superversive Radio and licensed under an attribution non-commercial share-alike international license. This episode was written and performed by T. James Glenn. Ben Wheeler directs, produces, and herds cats. Ken Dickinson is our audio editor. Visit us on Facebook, read articles on superversivesf.com, and wherever podcasts are distributed, you'll find us. Contact us through Twitter at Pinkerton's Ghosts, and email us at pinkertonsghosts at gmail.com. Be sure to check out T. James Glenn's works, which are available on Amazon, and quite a treat. See also his contributions to the Kursova magazine. Thank you for listening.